Welcome to this plenary session of the World Humanitarian Forum's Digital Summit. The focus of this session is the rise of philanthropy and CSR in this decade of action. I'm Richard Hawkes. I'm the chief executive of an international NGO called the British Asian Trust, and I'm honoured to be a member of the advisory board for the World Humanitarian Forum. I'm very pleased to be the moderator for today's event. I'm joining you from London. Um, good afternoon to those of you in New York. Good evening to anyone else in Europe. And if you're joining us from Asia, you're completely crazy and you should be going back to bed. Um, I'm delighted that we have a fantastic panel for this, this session um, and uh, all from uh, very different backgrounds within the philanthropy and CSR space. Uh, so we're, we're joined by Marcia Balisciano, the head of corporate responsibility from the Relics Group. Patrick Dunn, the chair of the EY Foundation, Debbie Wall, the executive vice president of the SAGE Foundation, and Dr. Valerie Nkamgang Bemo, the deputy director of emergency response for global <coughs> development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, in a second, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and say a few words of introduction. But before I do that, let me just say a few words to introduce the, the session. As, as you all know, the decade of action is basically the 10 years that the world has from this year to achieve the SDGs by 2030. It's been estimated that the finance gap to achieve the SDGs by then is between $2.5 and $3 trillion a year. And those estimates were before the COVID-19 pandemic the consequences of which we all know will be more people living in poverty, more people suffering ill health, and more people's lives totally destroyed economically. So it's more important than ever that every single one of us privileged to work in this sector does everything we can to help achieve the SDGs. And to do this, yes, we need more money, but we also need to innovate and we need to make the money that is in the system more efficient and more accountable. In this session, together with our panelists from the, the, the different backgrounds that I mentioned, we'll explore the rise of philanthropy and CSR and what we need to do in these areas to stand any chance at all of achieving the SDGs. So I'd now like to ask each of the panelists in turn to just introduce themselves, give a brief summary about uh, their role uh, and the, uh, their organisation. Um, and also maybe to just highlight um, one or two of the key points that they're going to want to make through the session. So if that's okay, we'll, we'll start with you, Marcia. Um, thank you very much, Richard, and it's a pleasure to participate, especially with such a distinguished group of panelists. I wanted to first tell you something about Relics. We're one of the world's largest media companies and we're focused on information, data, analytics, and events with 33,000 employees and operations in more than 40 countries. And we focus on our unique contributions as a business, which include universal sustainable access to information, which is a kind of overarching theme for us, advancing science and health, particularly through Elsevier, which is one of the world's uh, largest scientific information providers, protection of society, which links to our risk solutions business. And here we're doing things like fighting fraud. Uh, we focus on promotion of the rule of law and access to justice through LexisNexis, legal and professional, where we're cataloging the world's laws to advance the rule of law, making people around the world aware of what the laws are and doing our part to ensure due process underneath the law. We are also focused on fostering communities and have one of the world's largest events businesses. So our focus is on maximizing the positive impact of conducting our business on society and minimizing any negative impact, for example, in the environmental impact that we have in uh, running our business on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have specific philanthropic activities in terms of contributing to our local communities but our ethos is broader in how we think about it. And we call that corporate responsibility. And you can use lots of different terms, but it's about investments of knowledge, resources, and skills. And a good example of that is our free Relics SDG Resource Center, which is focused on bringing a wide range of content from across our business, uh, including key partners from within the UN system, like 
UN Global Compact, UN Development Program, UN Environment Program, to inform and encourage action on the SDGs. So for example, you'll see on the homepage, our colleagues at LexisNexis Legal and Professional built a news tracker. It is a drawing on over 70,000 news sources to get up to the minute news on the SDGs. So you can search by SDG or by uh, geography. Or we have a new SDG mapping tool, which we introduced this year, so that we can crowdsource, if you will, the ideas of people around the world and over 10,000 unique users every month to the site to match information to specific SDGs and specific targets within those SDGs, uh, which help to inform and link up knowledge and research to the SDGs. Uh, we have a podcast, for example, uh, that I had the pleasure of hosting uh, this year on the impact of COVID-19 on the SDGs. It's such a challenging year uh, for everyone around the world. And we were very interested to explore with a range of different viewpoints, how that impacted on the SDGs. And it's a series that's continuing. And just yesterday, um, again, drawing on that theme of universal sustainable access to information, we launched a special issue on the Resource Center for World Alzheimer's Day with leading articles and book chapters, 25 different sources. So I'm trying to convey the sense that for us, it's about really using and understanding what we're good at and working to maximize that in concert with other partners. Um, Marcia, that was great. I, I, I sh I'm breaking all the rules of, uh, 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 of chairing at the moment. Can I, just a very quick question though, if you don't mind. The, that, that tremendous work that you're saying that you're doing about things like, you know, the, the SDG Resource Centre and the SDG Mapping Tool, is that aimed at the sort of ordinary Relex customers or is that aimed at people who um, are specifically looking for that sort of information? Are you trying to convert people to get them interested in the SDGs in effect? It's really for anyone and everyone. Um, there is content there, for example, from The Lancet, which has been a real leader in scientific information, particularly, um, you know, their work during uh, the pandemic. So they have a free um, COVID-19 resource center, which you can get to through the SDG Resource Center. So it could be people who are interested in very specific pieces of information, or it could be young people doing um, research to help uh, understand aspects of the SDGs. So it's really anyone and everyone. Excellent. Okay, that's very good. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll all be looking out for that as soon as this session's finished and downloading whatever we can that's free on it. So uh, very good indeed. Um, okay, Marcia, thank you. Can we uh, go move to you next, Patrick, please, if that's okay? Yes, sure. So, um, well, welcome everybody, and uh, it's great to to be here. I mean, it is um, fantastic group of people to be with. I suppose I, I'm uh, a businessman, and I'm uh, also a, a sort of serial social entrepreneur. So, I've built uh, four different uh, social enterprises, charities, uh, all actually involving corporate philanthropy. Uh, and so, I chair the EY Foundation, which is a quite an innovative corporate foundation. It's not a grant giver; it's a direct delivery charity and it's focused on helping young people from uh, challenging backgrounds get into into work we've helped about 13,000 young people in the in the six years since we've we started uh, I founded Warwick in Africa which which teaches maths and English and trains teachers in slums townships and rural areas in Ghana Tanzania and South Africa uh, in 2006 and we helped about uh, we've helped over 750,000 children now uh, improving their maths uh, and English. Warwick in Africa led to the thing that I'm probably going to uh, talk about most with the EY Foundation, something called ESSA, which I founded in 2006 to try and work on big systemic issues in African education. So we've done three things so far. The first is to, uh, actually we should, have, we should have partnered with Marcia, uh, but we, uh, we built the first free online database of all the research that we could find of quality done by Africans on African education because it frustrated me that 
that African researchers didn't really have a voice and a lot of people were making investment decisions without understanding what, what African research said. So we, we've done that. Um, we've also created a scholarship impact hub um, because I was frustrated by uh, the, the poor performance of many scholarship programs. So we looked at over 400 scholarship programs, looked at what the characteristics of the best were, developed a KPI framework, which UNESCO have now uh, endorsed, uh, with the aim of trying to make the existing money in scholarships do better uh, in terms of impact but also attract more money into the scholarship sector, which is greatly needed at the moment because people have greater confidence in it. Um, and then the third thing was to do a really groundbreaking piece of work with the Ghanaian government, the African Association of Universities and the Population Reference Bureau on the demographics of faculty. There's a desperate shortage of faculty uh, across Africa, particularly in science and we didn't feel people were talking about this and they didn't have the evidence of this, but we've now uh, successfully modeled Ghana, shown what the, the, the shortages are, and we're now moving on to do that in six further countries in, uh, in, in East Africa. Um, finally, on, on, uh, on ESSA, we've got a very exciting program emerging uh, around developing women leaders in African education. There are very few professors. So for example, Ghana, there are only eight women professors. Uh, we want to build uh, a peer network, uh, create development programs for, um, for women, for the pipeline to, to get to those, to get to those, those phases. Uh, on EY Foundation, um, we, uh, we've been piloting something which is really exciting, which is, uh, well, originally when we started doing this, it's called virtual work experience because we were coping with the pandemic. But now I think that's quite real work experience. Um, but we have a very uh, interesting way of looking at the, the issue of youth unemployment, which I think is applicable across the world. Most people, when they talk about this subject, they focus on helping young people to develop uh, skills, characteristics, which will make them more employable. We do do that, but actually, as great a part of our focus is on helping employers to have proper pathways for people from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds to get into those uh, into, into those companies at the at the right level and get the development they need, so they're not stuck uh, at, at, at the bottom. So that balance of thinking about employers and young people, I think, is is very applicable in Africa. We'd we'd um, We'd love to expand, uh, expand what we're doing. So that's a, a quick summary, Richard, of um, the, the sort of things I'm in, involved can, in. Can, can I just check there? The, so EY, found, is, it, it, EY mm. Foundation, I think, is focused in the UK, but the, the, the other, the, 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 all of the other things that you're involved with, that sounds like there's a global coverage there, especially in Africa, yeah? Yeah, so, so my focus generally is, is uh, UK and Africa. Okay. Okay, fascinating. Very, very good. Um, okay, Debbie, if we can go to, go to you next, that would be that would be great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Richard, for having me here today, um, and the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much. Um, just a little bit of background about Sage. Um, we're a UK um, technology company. Um, we're the biggest. UK-owned technology company actually now, and um, we operate um, in the small to medium business sector, uh, and we provide cloud-based software solutions for um, accounting and um, HR. Uh, we operate in 22 markets around the world, um, and I started Sage Foundation five years ago, uh, and we now operate in all those markets. Um, we've been using the term action philanthropy for the last five years, because really our biggest asset is our people. Um, and we, we use our people, our colleagues, but not only just our colleagues, our partners and also our customers to really um, be out in our local communities and be action orientated. Um, we focus on young people, uh, military veterans and women. Um, and that might seem a slightly interesting group uh, to focus on, but that was really um, when we came down to doing the research uh, within the business. Um, those were the three areas that um, were either already being supported or were there was an appetite to support. So our programs are all around work readiness, 
uh, education and access to education um, and entrepreneurial um, activity. So Sage is one of the largest providers of small and medium sized business um, software, as I've already said, and that obviously um, incorporates a lot of entrepreneurs, not just in the UK, but in all our other markets. So we um, have literally gone on a long journey over the last five years since we started um, and we've really narrowed it down to one core area of activity um, and that's around the future of work. So what Patrick was saying today um, in regards to work experience, that's something that we also um, are focusing uh, more heavily on, but not just giving uh, young people an opportunity uh, for work experience but actually helping other businesses to recognize especially our customers because we have a lot of business customers to recognize how important the future of work with young people is um, as we move forward um, so those are the, the key things that we um, we work on um, we're very um, we empower our people so we empower our colleagues our partners and our customers we give them a, a variety of grants which are all around the areas that I've just um, outlined but we also have a number of signature programs which are developing as we develop as a, as a foundation and um, we are a foundation in name only so we are um, an integral part of the sage business um, and we really feel that um, in order to um, make sure that we sort of take forward um, our, our program over the next few years we really need to kind of make sure that we're focusing on being innovative um, around the future of work and recognizing that there are many ways that philanthropy can help um, build pipelines for um, employment not just with young people but also with the other um, aspects that we support so young um, women and military veterans so in a nutshell that's that's really what what Sage Foundation is all around. That, that, that's great Debbie you said over the last five years you've you used the term action philanthropy just uh, just very briefly how do you, what, what would you describe the difference between action philanthropy and, and normal philanthropy? Uh, I think for us, action philanthropy is, is really about getting out there and doing it. Um, we, we obviously are, you know, we will lobby and, um, and, and, and work with governments and organisations on, on areas that we're particularly passionate about. And technology and innovation is obviously something that we, you know, we have done a lot of work on. And I'm sure our Future Makers programme will we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to uh, the piece around young people. But for us, it's really about getting out there and doing it and bringing our colleagues, our, our customers and our partners on that journey with us and empowering them to help us to support communities um, and really step in where big businesses such as Sage need to be over the next few years. So it is all about action rather than necessarily, you know, giving away huge amounts of money or a lobbying government for change in legislation. We are all about the action. Okay. okay, very good. We'll come on to some of that later as well. Valerie, Valerie was saved, saved you till last because I think you're, you're over there in Seattle. And so it's the, the middle of the day for you. So you're wide awake. Uh, so Val Valerie, over to you next, if that's okay. Um, thank you, Charles, and thank you for the invitation. And I think I'll jump on Debbie, like we are really actions. Um, as you know, I'm Valerie Bimo, the Gates Foundation. And uh, as you know, the Gates Foundation have been involved in so many topics, and I will be trying to not go to all what the Gates Foundation is doing. Um, as you know, we do for a lot on health, agriculture, financial services, sanitation, advocacy, etc. And with the value that all life has equal value, and we want to bring everybody with a productive and healthy life. Um, what I want to focus today, more importantly, is to say I'm working specifically in the humanitarian um, focus of the Gates Foundation that a lot of people don't know much about. And probably this is where I want to, to look, to, to speak a bit more about what are we looking at and how do we work. Um, it's really not necessarily like the, the huge place where the Gates Foundation, but as you mentioned about the role of the philanthropy and the innovation, but we still feel like we have a role to play as philanthropy as a foundation to, to, to try to, to push the system to innovate because we can take risk as a foundation. And the, the two things, the three things that we look at when we look at humanitarian is first to see the response. And, and when we look at the response, how do we be able to respond rapidly, fast, be having a flexible funding because we know the first 24, 48, 
um, hours can be critical. At the same time, we also know that we need to, to be accountable on the quality, then we can be fast and flexible, but we also start looking at how can we improve rapidly the, the way, how do we innovate? And if you look at what we saw when, for example, with the COVID and the pandemic, immediately after the, we saw it in, in China, we start looking like, okay, we need to start prepping the, the Africa looking at the, in, on the wall, looking at vaccine therapeutic immediately as we start solving the, like responding to COVID, you start having, looking at all the innovative plays because you know this is what makes the big difference. But in the meantime, the third area where we really work is about preparedness. And I like um, um, Richard and Debbie mentioned about the youth, the people, and for us it's about the local and national. Um, who falls at the first responder will be there before and after. And a lot of the time, we tend to see them as a victim instead of seeing them as a, an actor. And I think I wanted to focus on, to say it's important to have the preparedness, to have them on, to have the, 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 the work being done by them, the same way that Patrick looking at the university or Debbie looking at the youth. How do we put them at the center? At the, at the driving seats and how do we make sure that systems are, are prepared. And when we look at the COVID or the pandemic now, it just shows us that there's a lot of uncertainty and the fact that the world closing down is actually shown that we need each of them have to count on them first. And it's only then that we can have the help coming from outside. And this is something that with the pandemic, we should even look in more. And that is how we can achieve the SDG because it will be sustainable if they all do it because they will be more innovative than us because they know better and they can actually help us innovate better if we can listen to them, if you can put them at the center. I think this is some of the, the work in general that we do as a Gate Foundation emergency response. We res we're trying to respond fast. We're trying to bring innovation, innovative approach, but also we're trying to look at how do we um, support local and national institutions to be prepared and respond better. Thank you. Uh, Valerie, that's great. And I'm, I, 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 as a sort of follow up to what you said, I'm gonna, it leads into the first question that I was going to ask anyway. So, so I'll, ask, I'll ask you this first and then see if any of the others want, want to come in. You, you, you mentioned innovation. Uh, you, you talked about innovation quite a bit in the in, in your introduction, um, mm -hmm. and I, I said the same when I in in my introductory comments. I, I said that you know there is this huge finance gap. Um, we need more money, but equally we've got to innovate. We've 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 got to change things. We've got there's a lot of money in the system at the moment, and we've got to find ways of making that money more accountable, more efficient. But we've got to innovate. Um, have you got any good, good examples of genuine innovation uh, in this sort of in this whole philanthropy CSR space? Um, and what kinds of things do you think uh, we, you know, where do we need to innovate over mm -hmm. the coming years if we're really going to stand a chance of achieving the SDGs? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Richard. As you ask the question, when we're talking about first the philanthropy. I feel like our role in innovation is because we can take risk. We can take risk. And the first things as you can take risk, we also have to recognize that when you take risk, there's a risk of failure. And I think we'll not even call it failure if we learn something from it. Then as we philanthropy, because I assume the government, if you look at tax money, it's more difficult to take long term and take some of that risk because you have to show immediate, sometime immediate res result. When with philanthropy, we can take this risk and knowing that even if it doesn't achieve what we did, as long as we learn from that, and uh, I'm just giving the kiddo because uh, as you know, Bill Senior, the, the dad of Bill Gates just passed, passed away. And one of the things he always telling us is that if you, you, this, everything works so well when you say you take innovation and risk, that means that you are not risky enough. Because if you are risky, there's a chance that 5%, 10%, sometimes even 95% doesn't go the way you are, but that is where the learning are. And I think we need to focus on that. And that is the first things that the philanthropy can do. 
that we don't let, expect the other donors. Let, let me just ask you a question on that as well, because um, I, I, I've spent most of my, with all of my career in development, working for, for NGOs where I'm trying to attract funding. Um, and um, it, there's a nervousness from most NGOs to fail. Um, and actually, we need to encourage NGOs to be able to fail because you're you're absolutely right. If you're to innovate, you've got to take risks and you've got to you've got to fail at times. Um, do you do you think um, do you think Gates as a donor? Do you do you, do you think all of the people that you're funding around the world? Do you, do you think they feel com they would feel comfortable telling you at the end of a three year project that they'd failed? Um, no. And that you are so correct. Um, I remember I, I, I opened some of the grant of innovation. It takes a lot of, uh, even at the foundation, it takes a lot of courage and trust for the people to say, look, it doesn't go well. But the, the thing in that is that for innovation, a lot of the time, first, you may have a hypothesis or assumption, but it's a journey. Because if you knew everything, then you will not take in risk again. And sometimes, because we want to have so much information at the beginning, we tend to want to make, and then we don't take risk. And what are the thing? I had a lot of innovative projects. It's difficult because sometimes I have to convince them that it's okay to fail, that it's okay if it's not going through. But they don't. They just feel like nervous. It's only after we start working. And what I actually do is that I don't wait for the three years to say it's good. We work together. We said, look. I can bring you some technical and some expertise as well. Let us do together because I need to learn as well. And then we, we talk often so that you don't wait from the end. And then you tell them it's actually let us ad adjust and change route as we go. Then in that case, it's not failure, but we, we feel enough, uh, enough trust between the organization so that we can feel like it's, it's a risk worth taking. And a lot of the time, like, I think two weeks ago, I have a project in Lebanon. It's I've been dragging for almost six years, and we repurpose, we readjust. And last week, we have a call. I said, can we agree that this one, is just not working, and that we just stop now? And they were so released. They say, actually, we think so. we, we, are, we, are, we are glad. I said, I'm not even penalized because we know this. But can we take lesson learned about it? Can we actually develop a case study to understand what make it if you have to do it again, what did we do differently? And how do we do taking, what is it? Sometimes it's political reasons. Sometimes it was not, the, it was the design. Sometimes we did not anticipate some, sometimes we didn't have a good assessment of the beneficiaries or the people themselves or the markets in the country. There's so many other factors, but if we can stop by the end, even if it's a failure and to say, what is it? That is actually for me a success. Yep. If you can identify what is it yep. and how we can do it different so that the next, the next level of research of risk, you already have learned something new that will help us to the next level. Yeah, no, I agree. The, the great answer. Um, any of the other three of you, can you, do you want to come in on this and talk about I I innovation at all or pick up on the, any of the points that Valerie was making there? Debbie, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think um, as, a, as a corporate sometimes I think we're in a better position to be able to innovate and take a bit more risk because we are not in that position which you would be if you're an NGO or, or a charity where taking risk and it not working out can be really fundamental so we've done a lot of projects where we've if you like taken the risk on um, and some of them have worked and some of them haven't um, and we're also in a great position being a tech company we have a team of innovators you know we've got a team of them in the us a team of them in spain a team of them in the uk and actually they're really hungry to get into projects that are outside of their sort of day job which is you know let's be honest innovating um software packages which you know i'm, I'm guessing can probably get a bit boring sometimes so we do an innovation jam every year where we literally take um different charities that we work with and we say to them look you know how can we help you to innovate what are, what are the projects that you need our help with so we look at it from a really kind of almost external perspective and we look outside of the box because actually we don't always have the knowledge that the ngo or the charity have got so for us you know it's, it's one of the most successful projects that we run every year the innovation jam because our colleagues are just so you know up for 
for, for helping you know, find different ways of tackling some of the challenges. Um, for example, during COVID, we did one which was sort of thrown together, if I'm being honest, in a very short period of time. But the, the colleagues were, my colleagues were all coming to me and saying that we really want to help charities during COVID. How can we, how can we help? So we did a 48 hour uh, big, big conversation online um, where we had 25% um, of our colleagues globally getting involved with that conversation. And we put up on the conversation a number of different scenarios with charities that needed our help around COVID. And we've come up with solutions. Now, we're now at the experimental stage with the charities where we're trying to help them to kind of see how they can take some of the um, ideas that we put forward and make them into reality. And for sure, you know, not all of them will. There was 19 uh, sort of problem solving teams that were put together. And I would imagine that when we get to the end, uh, at the end of the year, there's probably gonna be three or four that are really like solid that will lead on to a bigger innovative project. But I think, you know, that that's where I, I guess Sage can sort of take a risk that maybe um, an NGO can't. It's probably, it's the, those, those tech innovators were the people that were developing things like Zoom a couple of years ago and everyone would have said they're crazy, that's not going to take off. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, I think just quickly on innovation. I think innovation often conjures up an image of new ideas and that, but actually sometimes you can innovate just by making an existing system a lot better. So a very simple example of that was we, we discovered in ESSA that the, the dropout rate for many scholarships, most scholarship programs is about 30%. So if you could get that down to 5%, you save literally, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, which can be deployed more more positively. If you look at fraud rates, you know you can they're typically twenty percent. So you get those down to ten percent. You save again. So I think innovation, particularly around some things, um, actually is about a lot of marginal gains because the scale is so big. And then applying those marginal gains to a big scale, you get actually a massive massive improvement. So I think the NGO world is is very good at coming up with new ideas. I think that's you know one of its great strengths. Um, but also I think there's a place for working, innovating on systems and process so that you can actually get and it's sometimes much bigger gains than a new idea. But you need both. Yeah, totally agree. Marcia. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. wanted to pick up maybe on what Patrick was saying about, um, you know, it's not always a new idea. And we've had 10 years of the RELICS environmental challenge. So we started it when we thought there wasn't enough focus on access to water. What makes our project maybe a little bit different is that we provide access to all of the environmental content on Science Direct, which is the world's largest scientific database. Uh, to help um, the, the shortlisted projects. And when we started, we really didn't know quite what we were doing. We offered a $50,000 first prize and a $25,000 second prize. We just had an, an, uh, a yearning to try and um, use our convening power and to, to begin this new prize. And what we've seen over the last 10 years is that what we ended up doing is supporting entrepreneurs in WASH. Um, so that is water, improved water and sanitation. And sometimes it's not that the technology is groundbreaking. It could be that the, the uh, philanthropic partner is gonna come up with a new way of marketing something, uh, engaging more people on, on the local community to be involved or using technology around an existing technology. For example, eWaterPay is one of our past winners. And what they do is um, uh, make it easier for people to pay for water for the maintenance of it. Um, also make it easier to report when, when uh, water points are not working. So it's sometimes, um, to Richard's point, isn't always about um, the newest solution. It's about using ingenuity to make things work better, whether that is a new solution or it's an existing technology. But I, I just wanted to flag something that's hot off the press today. Um, on the RELX SDG Resource Center, 
we have launched um, something that we committed to do publicly at the beginning of this year to produce an SDG graphic for every SDG. So what we're looking at is what is the state of knowledge underpinning the SDG? And one of the biggest takeaways for me is around the need to create stronger partnerships. So that's an innovation that we need to see. So I wanna give you some of the quick statistics that come out of this uh, research. Less than 1% of research on the SDGs came from low income countries. Yet those are the countries that are on the forefront of some of the most pressing challenges that the SDGs are trying to solve. Um, of all the SDGs, the highest share of their output was only 2.9% out of a field of research, which is um, uh, 4 million publications between 2015 and 2019. So um, that was on SDG 17, um, that 2.9%, which is ironically partnerships for the goals. Um, and only 7% of the, uh, of the highest amount of output um, came through, so for high income countries, 7% of their, of their research publications on the SDGs came through collaboration with the SDG, uh, with low income countries. But yet 73% of the output of low income countries was the result of collaboration with high income countries. And, um, among the SDGs that are researched, high income countries are looking at issues for industrialized com countries, primarily, for example, SDG three, good health and well-being. While that affects all the countries of the world, um, that is one where there's the strongest uh, amount of output by high income countries. Um, another one would be SDG seven, which is affordable clean energy. But yet SDGs that address um, issues affecting the world's poorest, like SDG 1, uh, no poverty, or SDG 2, zero hunger, um, these have the, the lowest share of, of output. So there's something in here that tells us that we need to create better partnerships. And, we, and I, I liked what, what you were saying, Patrick, earlier about trying to encourage indigenous research. And that's something that, you know, this what, what this shows us is what the, where the problems are, but we also as companies need to be part of the solution. And a good example for us would be something like uh, Research Without Borders, where we are taking um, some of our experts in normal pre-COVID times, but now online, um, to work with researchers um, in Africa through publications like Scientific African to increase their share of uh, of the output on the issues that they are so knowledgeable about. That's fascinating, Marcia. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to, um, I'm just going to jump forward. A number of you in your introductory comments talked about the importance of, of young people. Um, and so I'm just going to, I'm going to jump to, a, to, to, a, to that theme. So um, with, with young people being recognized as important catalysts for the SDGs to be achieved, how do, how do you think that philanthropy, how, how can philanthropy assist in bolstering young people's development and education? Um, looking at the examples like the EY Foundation's employability workshops that, that, that you mentioned, um, it, it, what ways can philanthropy fill mm. in the gaps for young people in those kinds of ways? Uh, maybe Patrick, if you want to go first on that one. Yeah, so uh, I think there's a whole, a whole range of different ways. So one, it's about equipping young people uh, two, it's about giving them opportunities uh, and it's making that that sort of the pathways to a successful sort of adult life uh, much improved. One of the things that we found in well, in all the things I, I, I've done now uh, is is because they're all around young disadvantaged people and, and education uh, is actually having a, a number of young people on the board uh, having properly constructed youth advisory boards so that young people are not just at the heart of what you do they're at the head of what you do so we've had some wonderful examples of you know a lot of innovation coming from the the young people which has actually then made them far more employable uh because they've they've come up with these great ideas they have challenged thinking in uh in really refreshing ways especially 
um, in my experience of, of, of young Africans um, over the last 15 years has just been astonishing. If, if I look at Warwick and Africa or ESSA, a lot of the innovation, a lot of the ideas that we have had have come from those young people and we've picked them up. We've got, you know, experience of other things, but we've actually involved them throughout the, throughout the process. So rather than seeing them as a beneficiary, which they are, seeing them also as an enabler and a deliverer and a stimulator and an influencer and uh, seeing them more broadly, you know, getting more young people on boards, I think will be a great thing. I think a lot of uh, people would benefit from, uh, fr from that. And most importantly, I think listening to them. Um, I spend a lot of time as chair just hanging out whenever I can, just listening to what they think. I ask them, you know, what do you think we should have on our board agenda? Uh, you know, what do you think the executive should be doing next? You know, all of these things. And that's where a lot of our innovation has come from um, because they're encouraged to have a, have a voice, have a view. Uh, and then you have to do something with it. You know, if you, if you get people to talk and you don't do anything with it, nothing happens. Uh, so when you, when you think, ask them what should be on their board agenda, how many of them say, minutes and actions from the last meeting any other business well they they tend not to pick on those things richard but interestingly exactly we we've provided training for all the young people who do go on board so that they can yeah. cope with all the process stuff but they they just think of things you'd never think of yeah, um, yeah, yeah. which is great yeah valerie you were nodding a lot then do you want to do you want to come in on on that or were you, were you just excited about a board meeting agenda of course, of course, <laughs> always. Who would not be excited about the board meeting agenda? But I just what I was nudging because um, one of the things that he mentioned is about not to take them as a beneficiaries, but as actor. And and this for me is is essential. Mm. When you start seeing them differently, and you see them as the ownership and actors, and we are just there to help them to achieve whatever they see, it completely changes the dynamic. And, uh, and I think that is the first thing, to listen to them and not just listening with our ears and with already our mind, with the, 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 the savior mind, but listening with our heart to understand and to let them thrive. That is the first thing I wanted to, to mention. The second piece is that I, I was just mentioning because uh, this is the beginning of the, the school years. I have a lot of nephews that I'm taking care of, I think. And just the conversation, when you start asking them, when I start saying, okay, you should do this, it's a different dynamic than when I say, what do you want to do with your life? And let me tell, how do you want me to help? And it's completely changed the dynamic because you can see the excitement. You can see they're willing. And it's not the first time you ask because the first time they're like, what do you want to hear? And initially they will try to please what you, they think you want to hear. And that is even, and this is my nephews or my friends of the kids I'm taking care of, then they are used to me. Then imagine you go for you that you don't know. The first thing they want to tell you is what they think you want to hear until you uh, establish that trust, that relationship, then they'll be willing to tell you what they really think and what they really make sense for them. And that is the power of listening or be patient and actually pushing them, but be also mindful to understand what they mean, and sometimes it's in between the line that you read it, what exactly they mean. And I think I just wanted to, to share that as being part of the, the three different worlds and, and, and be able to interact with that. Yeah, um, that's I think it's important. Very, very important. Let me, ju let, 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 let me just um, pu push all a little bit. This specifically talking about the role of philanthropy with, with young people. Um, I, I, think, I think it's always really important within our, our sector, our field of work, that, you know, we have to be careful about when it is appropriate to use philanthropy. And sometimes philanthropy can let governments off the hook. Um, and, you know, we don't want philanthropy to fill all the gaps uh, that, that arguably we, we do want governments to, to, to be filling and, and, and taking their responsibilities. So what we're, specifically with young people, where do we think, what's the role of philanthropy and CSR um, in supporting young, young people as opposed to, you, you know, where we should be encouraging government to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think it's, it's not one 
one size. I think it's not one against the other. And I think we should not put it against. And I just looking at the foundation with the SDG, we have the, the goalkeeper. And a lot of them are young people in their country who are goalkeeper that the foundation use them for their voice and advocacy, but also to work with their government because we cannot come and replace a system that is there. We are here to support. And the more we look at both systems, that means that, for example, Patrick talking about the researcher and the schooling, you can create for outside, but if you cannot help them to have the education that is needed, that is the government, and ensure that you have the quality education or academic program as well, you actually will not succeed just with philanthropy. I think both are important and we need to, to try to, to bring that bridge that gap and also support the government to support them while we support them directly. I think we need to embrace it in a more holistic way and not trying to separate them because that is where we start creating the issue to see the government as the bad or the philanthropy as the good or vice versa. And I think that is where the problem is actually. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, I can see that you want to come in, but can we just get, let's just go to Debbie first, if that's okay, and then... then. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, from, from our perspective, we've always tried to work, like um, Patrick said, bringing our, the young people, when we're working on young people projects, to the forefront of those projects, and actually helping them to become educated in an area or, or, or a challenge or a problem, and helping them to be part of the solution. So if I think about, um, not just in the UK, but I use the UK as an example, just because it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an easy one for me to, to talk about. But um, if we look at um, AI, artificial intelligence, um, and the fact that in the UK, sadly, that's not um, taught in schools, and kids are not given the opportunity to understand how not only AI is going to affect their lives um, in all education and in all their you know, potential jobs, um, they're just not, they're not exposed to that. And that's not just kids that are from less um, advantaged backgrounds that could be any 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 young person so we've put together a project called future makers where we're encouraging young people to go on a, a short course with us where they literally learn about the importance of ai so they don't actually learn how to do ai they just learn about the importance of it and through those young ambassadors we're then using them to kind of educate their friends and their families and their schools and get their schools encouraged uh, to, 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 you know, really address the issue that um, young people just don't understand AI. And what's really interesting is, is when we start to give them examples of AI and how AI is used, they always look to the philanthropic angle. So if we're saying, right, okay, this is what voice recognition, this is how you use voice recognition, go away in your groups and come up with some ideas about how you could make, how you could then use that in your life. And they all come back with something to do with philanthropy, whether it's helping deaf people or helping old people that, you know, might need, might be at home on their own. So there's, a, there's definitely a, an understanding in young people that they need to help other people. So what we try and do at Sage is we try and encourage that so that we bring, we bring young people on, on the journey with us and we and we make sure that they're part of our philanthropic work rather than being the ones that that, that um, benefit from it great uh, Patrick I was just going to say one of the one of the things I've learned a lot is is not to hide the difficult stuff from young people so I remember sitting in a, in a village in Tanzania uh, and, and actually sharing with the young people what how the education budget was spent and asking them if they were the finance minister and the education minister, how would they spend it? And, and the, the challenge they had was if they were going to spend more on something, they had to spend less on something else. Uh, so that, and it was really interesting. They had quite different priorities uh, in terms of, they actually wanted their teachers to be paid more. And the reason they wanted that was they thought they'd get better teachers. <laughs> so they said, we'd rather have fewer better teachers. <laughs> than a lot of teachers who aren't as, as good as they thought. Uh, they were making some really, you know, it was like a sort of business meeting, but these were, you know, 13 year olds who'd, who'd not been exposed to a business, but they just, it was brilliant. If you'd asked me at that age, I'd have just asked some more chocolate. Yeah, but um, you know, <laughs> yeah, they were great, but I think you know, also they- what they, waste they, I, I mean. Yeah, they wanted to, to um, uh, yeah. They wanted to get rid of all the ghost teachers on the payroll so that they yeah. would have more proper teachers. They came up yeah. with some fantastic stuff because you yeah. shared the difficult stuff. Very good. 
Marcia. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say uh, there are three programs that, or three partners mm. of ours that come to mind. Uh, we are signatory to the United Nations Global Compact, which is 10 principles related to human rights, labor, environment, and anti-bribery. And they have a really fantastic program, um, which is called the Young SDG Innovators Program. And it's an opportunity for young talent um, to collaborate and accelerate business innovation toward the SDGs. It's a 10-month accelerator program uh, that tries to activate future uh, business leaders and change makers to develop and drive innovative solutions. They, these young people tend to be associated with member companies, but keep in mind there are more than 10,000 corporate signatories to the Global Compact, and they're not all large multinational companies. Um, so uh, this is a great opportunity to harness those ideas. I also wanted to flag um, the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, where I have the privilege of serving on the board. And uh, we've got a project that we're supporting with young African entrepreneurs um, who are doing a program in association with the University of Bordeaux to try and uh, workshop ideas that they have uh, in their communities to advance the SDGs. And then finally, another really great partner on the SDG Resource Center is called Global Citizen. Um, and they uh, use the arts and artists to uh, get messages across and to catal really catalyze philanthropy, um, including they raised, um, and we contributed in a small way, very small uh, compared to their total budget of $127 million that they raised uh, toward the WHO Solidarity Response Fund, which I know um, the Gates Foundation contributed to uh, as well. Very good. Um, we're, we're, we're approaching the, the, the end of the session, but um, my colleagues from the World Humanitarian Forum have said it is we can go over by a few minutes. Um, if you're all, you're all okay to do that. So before I come to you, just for your concluding comments that you might want to make, I've just, just one more question. The last question I just want to pick up is about the impact of COVID um, and the, 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 the fact that, you know, now more than ever, uh, we all need to be more flexible and, and adaptable. And we've, we've, all of our organisations have had to do this at a pace that I don't think any of, it, any of us had envisaged was possible um, six months ago. Um, but do you think that philanthropy, grant giving, CSR, do you think that those, that those areas that we've, we've been talking about, do you, think, do you think they're all able to be as flexible as they need to be um, in, the, in the years ahead? Um, you know, and I, there might be examples in your own organisations that you, 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 you could refer to, but that, that flexibility, that, that, the, the need to be nimble and agile is, is going to be absolutely crucial, I think, in, in all of this space. And I just wonder whether or not, you, you know, we have, it, 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 that, that's going to be possible or whether there are, there are inherent barriers in, in what we will do that prevent that. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to... Yeah, I'll, I'll kick off. I mean, I don't think it's homogeneous. So I think I've seen some fantastic examples. I mean, Dubai Cares have been incredibly flexible, open-minded, still very impact-focused, but but fine. I've seen other other people be incredibly rigid. You know, you said you'd deliver this uh, in uh, in August, and um, you know they've they've spreadsheet driven. Um, and, and they just think, you know, have you not realised what's been happening? <laughs> you know? So we have one situation where we, we're working in schools, the schools are closed, we can't deliver the impact. And so we say, but you haven't delivered the impact. Well, <laughs> yeah. of course, yeah. but, but we, we've, we've upskilled the teachers instead while they've been off. And they say, well, that's not what you promised you'd do. <laughs> so well, no. so I, I, th I don't think it's on use. I think there's a lot of innovation coming out of this and particularly around education, there's a lot of different ways of doing things which are, which are fabulous, but, but it has accentuated the digital divide, which I think is, uh, is really challenging. Yeah, Valerie. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we learned with COVID is that uh, mm. we don't have choice to be flexible and to be agile and nimble. Mm. And I think uh, we all learn and uh, all organizations know any organization who do not do that will perish. I think for me, that mm -hmm. is the, the worst. And what we did with uh, most of our partner and grantees, we have an opening question. Some of them, we even supplement them because especially 
for the small organization, it's been even more challenging because sometimes they have to, if they, they have been the nonprofit who have been working on the day to day with the project, a lot of them told me when I started to say, yeah, we have mm. to cut the staff or the salary or we stop. And then we actually managed to give some bridge bridge gap funding, bridge funding to help them to survive, to, to, to extend, to pay salary and to pay the, some of the local organization I talked to, they even stop paying the electricity bill and uh, they bring something from home because they couldn't pay. And I'm like, that is not acceptable. And I think for me, that is where the flexibility and that is where the partnership as well. And I'm coming to a culture where it's in this moment that you know who are your good, your real friend, like we said. And I think um, we have been able to support some organization to extend the, the grant to say, okay, let us extend it for a year. And sometimes we do a supplement to help them go through financially or administratively. And I think that for me is essential. And uh, unless we start looking at COVID as just not a passage, a something for but to start thinking like how do we interact how what is the relationship has community means and at all level not just as how we put the put the mask or behave but also how partnership is function and how tr what trust means yeah thank you yeah thank you debbie um i yeah i mean i, I agree with everything that patrick um and Valerie have said and i think Certainly in our experience, the organisations that we're supporting that are able to pivot. So, you know, really take advantage of the situation. And like Valerie, we've brought some of our grants forward and we've helped some of the organisations. And we do work with a lot of small organisations. And what we've seen in some organisations where they've just pivoted their whole model and, and, and really gone that extra mile, they're going to be the ones that succeed. And sadly, the ones where there isn't that ability to pivot are going to be the ones that, that fail. And I think from our perspective, what's been really interesting at SAGE is we've always had a, a very strong volunteering program. Um, we do sort of 35,000 days of volunteering a year across 12,000 colleagues, which is not a huge number. And what we've really interested, we, what we've really noticed is that more and more colleagues are coming forward and partners as well, actually, and wanting to volunteer. So it's really highlighted the need for us to really support our communities. So we might not done, have done as many days because obviously, you know, a lot of our work has had to be remote. But what we have really noticed is that the engagement levels have, have really heightened um, amongst our colleagues which I think is really encouraging um, and, and it's definitely a positive thing to come out of all this horror. Yeah yeah tremendous. Marcia. Well just to echo what the colleagues have said about being flexible ourselves um, as funders so one of the things that I hope will change and this is uh, something that I've seen a bit of in the last um, months, few months, is that rather than require yet another project, if we believe in, in our beneficiaries' core mission and the, their very existence, then we need to support them in the core work that they do. And I think that is something that often, for example, colleagues don't understand because you are always looking for impact and you know, uh, making a difference. But at some, at some point, and I think what COVID-19 has highlighted, we, the, the organizations that we care about, we need to be supporting them um, to get through this crisis and, and to come out stronger. And for us, we have a central budget, which is usually um, for this stream of funding is decided by a network of Relax Cares champions. We have over 200 of them across the business. And usually uh, we need an application and an internal sponsor. And it has to be a project that advances one of those unique contributions that I mentioned at the, in my introduction. But instead what we did is we just took the whole of the budget and we just, we looked at any organization that we had supported in 2018 and then in 2019. And in April, we gave the whole of the budget, just divided it up and gave it to them um, without them having to ask. They were very, very pleased and surprised, but we just thought, you know, we, we need to support, find, find ways to be innovative ourselves. That's, that's 
tremendous. And as, as, as someone who works for an NGO, it's always music to my ears when anybody talks about the importance of funding core. Um, but equally, I think sometimes NGOs forget the, the responsibility that we have to then be demonstrating to donors and supporters that, we, that, that how effective and efficient we are and how we're using that money, even if it's funding core, that we're using that money effectively and we're, finding, we're still finding good ways of reporting back on that. So I, th I think it's really important that donors think that way, but I think it's really important that recipients of that funding don't get too relaxed about it and recognise that they've still got to demonstrate efficiency, impact and, 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 and so on. But every, everybody's nodding there, so I think we, we all agree. Um, I'm afraid we're, we're, we're running out of time, so um, I, I'll just go to each of you and just see if there's any final points, just, just one minute that, that, that you'd like to make for the, the, the people that are, that are watching us. So I don't know if, if, who'd like to go first. If there's, you don't have to say anything, just as a closing remark, but if you'd like to, pa Patrick. Just keep well, everyone. Keep doing the great work you're doing. And um, uh, I, I think it'll make such a difference. Very good. Valerie. Um. I just wanted to say that we are in the uncertainty time, but uh, just actually it is really still important for us to, to think as a community and to, to think that the other people are similar as us and our sense of empathy and our sense of uh, love for others and the way we look at the, the people, not as beneficiary, not as victim, but as part of the solution will actually help all of us in the be a better world. Thank you. Very good. Debbie? I think the, the whole piece around innovation um, and bringing, bringing the NGOs and all the people that us corporates support on that journey with us. Um, and I think we can be really powerful if, if we, we continue to innovate and, and, and work together to find new and interesting uh, solutions to current and new problems as they arise. That's it. Well, like Valerie said, when something isn't working, you can't be afraid of walking away and saying stop and, and rethinking. On, on the other side, we need to be in there for the long term. And an example for us is through our Elsevier Foundation and a program called Research for Life, which works uh, with uh, researchers in less developed countries to provide either free content or low cost content. Um, and we've been doing that and trying to think uh, every way possible over you know, more than 15 years, um, uh, you know, how to advance this project. Um, so be, be thinking about the, the long term as well as you know, the challenges that we have on the horizon today, particularly necessary, as you said, in the decade of action that we have ahead to see in the next 10 years uh, realizing the sustainable development goals. Very good. Thank you very much. So Valerie, Marcia, Debbie, Patrick, thank you all ever so much for your, uh, your time, the preparation you put in, your contributions uh, to that session. Uh, for for Val Valerie, you can now go and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, I think those of us in Europe, we can all go to bed now. Um, I, I, I really do appreciate the, the, the contributions you've made. It's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'd like to also thank especially all of the people that have uh, been watching this, this session. Um, I hope it's been useful, informative and interesting for all of you. And I'm sure you'll be able to follow up with the World Humanitarian Forum on any of these issues if, if you would like to do that. Uh, and finally, just to say thank you to the colleagues from uh, WHF for all of their tremendous work in, in putting this, this session together. Uh, so with, with that, I'd like to say thank you all very, very much indeed for, a, for an excellent session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>